G'day, I'm Alistair Christie from LearnDelphi.tv and today I'm here with David I from Embarcadero. Hey everyone, I'm here with Alistair. We're in, uh, we're in the Embarcadero office in Sydney. S Sydney, yeah. So just um, yesterday was a, um, the sort of Australian Developer Day, um, which is uh, held at the Australian Technology Centre, which is quite, uh, quite an impressive complex in terms of its um, sort of combination of industrial and sort of modern. It's like an old train yard in one of the yeah. train bays, and they've turned it into a incubator slash technology conference center. It was yeah. really cool. So yeah, sort of we used to re repair all um, lo locomotives, um, the old train steam, well not steam trains, but um, well, it might have been. Yeah, probably old enough. Yeah, it was really cool. It was just great to be with all the developers and, it was, and it was with a good this day. with this guy. I'm sorry I didn't make it to New Zealand this trip. <laughs> yeah. Maybe next time. Sorry. Indeed. So you've, you've been uh, with. Uh, sort of in back of the Aero Emprise Portland um, for quite some time now. Um, sort of, uh, and also you do a lot of, lot of travelling. Um, with, with your travels, uh, do you find um, different countries have different things of parts of Delphi they get excited about, or is it sort of consistent across the globe? So, yeah, I've been doing this with these developer tools since June 17, 1985. So earlier this summer, Northern Hemisphere, uh, I celebrated 30 years and they brought a cake and we had fun for part of the day until we got back to work. <laughs> and in all my travels, in the early years, we had CompuServe and maybe email, but we didn't have the full-blown internet. And so some of the technologies that we were putting into our products, some of the languages that were emerging, like C moving into C++, for example, all the things we were adding to Object Pascal, uh -huh. uh, you know, getting to the Macintosh, so that's where we, we did Object Pascal uh, with extensions, and then beyond that interfaces, generics, and all. So when, when the internet was less of a thing, we had CompuServe forums, uh, people understood some of the language and some of the technology things, but especially as you got away from the U.S. or away from some of the big centers in Europe, you found that people were behind. You know, they weren't keeping track of what was going on in, in programming technologies and methodologies and so on. But that was in like the, the second half of the 80s and maybe the first half of the 90s. When, by the time Delphi 1 came on, in 95, in February 95, uh, the internet was starting to heat up. Yeah. Probably wasn't until the latter 90s that it was just full blown. Uh, indeed, yeah. And so I was still speaking at conferences in the 90s, introducing object oriented programming, introducing the notion of, of the property method event model, introducing I, polymorphism and, and virtual functions and all of that. Uh, there's a video of you on YouTube uh, um, where you discuss. Uh, sort of object oriented stuff um, from, as probably from that era. Yeah. So we had to explain some of those notions. I mean, people understood structured programming and spaghetti code and those kinds of things, but the, the modern, you know, object oriented programming base that started in the early days with small talk and other things, uh, it, it took a while for some of that, you know, UML modeling and other things to, to move along. So I was, it was fun to be able to introduce these notions to developers. Um, Otherwise, you know, computer science has been around, so algorithms, data structures, file systems, operating systems, we went through different user interfaces from punch cards to teletypes to graphics terminals to, you know, the modern day world of touch screens and all those things and we have. Huge displays, which now are yeah. quite affordable. But now when new, a new notion appears in a language, it's all over the planet. You know, if it's, uh, if it's, uh, a new user interface paradigm, if it's a, a, a new language, completely new programming language, a new framework, a new platform. I mean, we didn't have uh, mobile devices in the early days, and then we had sort of Nokia communicator and a few kind of what they're called feature phones, I guess, or little, yeah. little cell phones that weren't very programmable and had different screen sizes and APIs, so all those kinds of things. But now it's just all over the planet. I mean, and it's in real time, which is great. There's stuff popping up. Indeed, and the, um, you know, communication all over the world, um, 
in, 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 in basically real time, the video almost face to face. That's yeah, I mean, we do our webinars now. I, you know, yeah. I like coming out and visiting customers and speaking at conferences because you know, we get to do this thing side by side instead of on Skype or whatever. But, but now I can do webinars 6 a.m. and 11 a.m., 5 p.m., and it's all over the planet. Whatever time you have, pick one of those times. Or we do code rages, we go for 12 hours, three days. Uh, we've done some other things where we sort of chunk it up for maybe eight time zones. And that way, if you can't make one of them, you come to the next one. The little skill sprints, like you do your, yep. your learn Delphi TV, you, you pick a topic that teaches some developer something they can use immediately. Uh, you know, <laughs> we, we do the same thing as skill sprints, yeah. bite size, and then we have launches and bigger deep dives and all those but kinds of things. Certainly, as well. there's now so much video available on, on how to yeah. use Delphi. It's, it's quite, yeah. quite phenomenal. So, we're looking at how can we teach more tips and tricks versus features, building real samples, real solutions, not little snippets of code, and trying to do some more of those kinds of things. And we're out into this whole world of Internet of Things and devices and how to move beyond just a traditional desktop client server, SQL database world, which is very cool and fun. Indeed. What, what sort of the notable features, uh, your, your sort of favorite new things that sort of been introduced in Delphi the last few years? Well, you know, I, I every time I think about the continuum of uh, evolution or innovation, uh, and I think I put up on SlideShare 20 years of innovation. We did uh, earlier this February as a celebration of Delphi, we did Delphi Week uh, 2015, Jim McKeith and I and a bunch of friends and, and so on. We did, you know, five days in a row of sessions talking about Delphi programming. It wasn't like a remembrance or history lesson. It was really where has all these things come and what more can we show people and learn and, and talk about. So I do go back and think about the, the great thing that we've been able to do because this, we own this Delphi language and, and the technology that surrounds it, but we don't make smartphones and operating systems. So you know, interfaces, when interfaces first came along, uh, more recently anonymous methods, generics, uh, the FireMonkey framework, the idea of being able to go, uh, the parallel programming library, taking advantage of generics to have future variable values, uh, just trying to make threaded programming simpler. So sometimes it's not language syntax specifically, it's more uh, frameworks, runtime libraries, the, the platform support and the things that we can do as develop live bindings. Again, it's nothing to do with programming language, yep. but a very cool, easy way to connect a, you know, a data field to a user interface. Or you can write the line of code that does it as well. But uh, for me, when if somebody asks me for one thing, I'll say interfaces. Okay. Yeah, I, I think interfaces. Uh, also generics, are, I think. Yeah. Is the, the collection of library you can just, just change the way you program. You know, I mean, interfaces in Delphi 3 were brought in to yeah. make COM programming simpler because it was a Don Box, I think, used to do all these talks at Microsoft conferences. He'd have a whole day on how to do COM programming and how you have to do your own reference counting, releasing, and, and marshalling of parameters and all that stuff. And when with Delphi 3, we just said, here, here's an interface. And oh, by the way, if you look under the covers, there's all the reference That's counting, good, releasing. Yeah. And you're done. And then Microsoft, a couple years later, I remember it was Charlie Calvert and I were at the conference, and Microsoft introduced COM+. Plus. It had many different names. People had t-shirts with the code names, all crossed off, and then it was COM+. Plus. And they said, now you've got interface inheritance, you've got reference counting release. And, we're just, and everybody in the house was going, wow, this is phenomenal. All the VB people and whatever, this was even before .NET. It was like, Wow, this is awesome. And we're just sitting and looking at each other and we're like, yeah, we've had that for two years, you know. So and and I reason I bring that up as an example separate from my love of interfaces as a as a, as a as a language feature is that the thing we've been able to do by innovating all the time is look at what are the things that we can make simpler so that developers using Delphi can solve tough problems and build build hard what used to be hard to build applications. So making multi-tier simpler, making REST programming simpler, making connecting to devices simpler. And still though, it's runtime library and some language syntax, and it's components, non-visual and visual components. Uh, we just drop a component down and now I'm 
connected to a Bluetooth LE device. So I drop a component down, I'm now connected to a beacon doing proximity-based development, as opposed to writing you know, okay. an enormous amount of code. Yeah. So uh, my joke that will probably be on my tombstone, I hope, if there is one, or in the annals of David I was a nice guy and helped people, 10 lines of code, 10 minutes. If I can't write a program in that time that does something really meaningful, like master detail multi-tier, uh, then hire a real programmer. I mean, I can do master detail multi-tier with no lines of code using wizards and components. One, actually, sometimes one line of code to with a checkbox event handler to turn on it, to activate and deactivate the connection. Yeah, which you can do with live bindings quite often. Which you can do with live bindings. So, <laughs> often need to, you can actually get, it's surprising how sophisticated an application you can write with no code these days yeah Delphi. and I know there's other systems where people kind of design an application and somewhere under the cover something magic happens the other thing that I like is that we give you all the code it's generated binary code if you're using a runtime library or a component the source code is there I tell people light mining is a little scary for some people because it's like this engine that runs in a thread that's under the covers so I can understand some some people may be wanting to do it in code so they can visually see the code and check it into a change management system. Yeah, and it's something I, I, um, I am a little bit fearful of is um, it's, it's quite hard to tell if you, if you make a little mistake or something somewhere, uh, it's hard to find that mistake in, in sort of a, a live binding yeah. situation, but it's usually a lot more obvious in, in code. Yeah, well so if, if you look at the it, diagram close enough and you look at it and you stare at it long enough, and you save it as a bitmap and blow it up big and look at it again, you can probably see where you connected something. But, but again, the good news is we don't force you to use any of this. Mm. We don't force you to use any of the components. Use the runtime library. Don't use live bindings if you don't want. Don't use APIs that we have. Do something else. You, know, you have choices in Delphi. Uh, it's all there for you. The, the compiler, the languages, the frameworks, the tools. Uh, it's all there, and you choose. Just as we don't force so, you to a uh, architecture, two-edged sword sometimes, and what well, people write appalling code. But yeah, you know, we don't force you to yeah. use. This is the only way to do multi-tier. Yeah, you can roll your own. You can use Project Indie components and do HTTP and go for it. You know. Yeah, and there's this. There's lots of uh, ways of doing multi-tier now. The data snap and EMS yep. and you know queues, um, message queues. Uh, yeah. <laughs> message passing, token pass, I mean, there's every kind of thing you'd ever want. Uh, again, your choice. I prefer certain architectures for what they do, but, but you could start with file new console application, and you can start instantiating objects and doing things and create a whole GUI, you know, Windows app from scratch. Indeed. You can even do Why that. someone would want to, I don't know. Uh, you can even do textbook Pascal programs. Yeah, you still can actually, write a lens, you can do close file, assign file, rewrite, reset, all that stuff you can still do. I, I bought a Pascal book, I think, I think it was published in the 60s, and I did not recognize some of the, the code. Yeah, but you can it. I think the only thing we've, it, I, did we deprecate object in favor of class? Maybe you can still use object, I mean we have the I T object, sure. but, yeah. um, but, but I mean they're but otherwise, assignment statements, case statements, if statements, yeah, function calls, a, procedure calls. A, a lot of legacy uh, um, weird syntax that you can... Oh, there was other use. stuff, block write. I mean, there are different things. Yeah. But, but I mean, the, the meat and potatoes everyday textbook programming in Pascal, you can do that in Delphi 10 Seattle. It's yeah, indeed. Not that you would it's, want to, but Yeah, I mean, you can. Take, take advantage of... I mean, yeah. <laughs> Um, this, are there any features that you thought were going to be really huge but sort of fizzled and... I can't think of anything that we've put in that aren't being used by people and, and there was really thought. I mean, there's been some past products and frameworks that you know, didn't work out. You know, I, I, if I think back to Kylix and, and Clix, the VCL for Linux, for example, that was at a time where Linux was booming, you know, stock valuations were high, all of those kinds of things. 
we wanted to do something, we want to preserve your code, but then we built it on top of yet another framework that then underneath the and coverage QT went down, went down to the yeah. APIs and all that stuff. And, and we, you know, it had some success for certain people in that way, but it never felt native to me, you know, to each platform. What we're doing with FireMonkey now, where we, where we have the, the system unit, that's the, you know, the same thing, you functionality you'll have across all platforms. You guarantee sysutils, IO utils, whatever it might be. And then with FireMonkey for multi-device, multi-platform, we have a FireMonkey abstraction layer, as well as you know other abstraction layers for database and whatever that work across all these different platforms. And then we have to specialize on certain platforms to certain things because a camera might be different or a uh, input mm -hmm. device might be different, uh, whatever the screen size is. Well, we take care of that with all sorts of great anchoring and panels and, and multi-views and all those kinds of things. So. So I like what we've been doing in evolving the FireMonkey framework to meet the demands of these very different kinds of systems. And the fact that it uses interfaces to, to let you and for FireMonkey itself to test if a service is available. Like does it have a menu service? Does it have a mouse service? Or a camera. Does it have a camera service? Does it have a, you know, whatever it might be. Um, I think that gives developers and ourselves full control over what they want to do. And if you have to write a little bit of if-def code for some reason, on a certain platform, so be it. I mean, that's that's fine. But otherwise, you know, the the general code you're going to write, you want to put up a window, you want to put up some buttons, you know, you want to write some code, you're there, and you just change the target. I, I encourage all the Delphi developers that don't have Starter or Trial, where the RTL source code is there, is to go into the FireMonkey, the FMX source code subdirectory, and look for the patterns. Look for you know fmx.media.pass. That's the abstraction layer for media, right? For audio, video, and so on. And then look for the pattern of file names, fmx.media.win.pass, fmx.media.ios.pass, fmx.media. you know osx.pass and android.pass. And you'll see those all throughout, so you can actually see. Here's how we can reuse an enormous amount of Delphi code, and where we need to then because there might be differences in APIs or, or device interfaces and so on. You can go and look at the special the code we've written for you to handle those differences. And that to me is, is pretty cool. In VCL, you don't really have that because VC, in, and I'm making generalization, because VCL is a component and runtime library over the Windows API. You know, it's, it's just married to the Windows API. Yep. Right, and so there, you know, there's a window handle, and you know, and you're drawing and yeah, painting. There's a certain level of, of abstraction you can get to, and then you have the yeah. Windows API, and you, yeah. you don't know how an edit box is implemented from there. But it's a cool way to see how much now, over yeah. the years, the FireMonkey abstraction layer has stabilized and, and is implemented across all the platforms. You know, that again are have the same kind of functionality. If we have a machine in the future that doesn't have a screen, okay. But again, then we test. The services you'll see FireMonkey itself when it starts up checking to see, and you can see. Do you have a mouse service? If you do, you get the mouse service, and you can do things with the mouse in your code. So take a look at FireMonkey and those patterns in the FMX source code that have the file patterns with the platform specific stuff, and see how little code, in many cases, are in each of those platform things, because we've done the work over the years improving the framework to abstract and, and reuse a bunch of code that works just across all platforms. Indeed. I'll, I'll have to have a look. I mean, I'm quite familiar with the uh, a lot of the VCL source code. Um, yeah, just look for those really file name patterns. They sort out very nicely in the Windows Explorer, so you can, you can see them sort of right next to each other in line. And, and take a look at that. There's nothing like looking at the source code. Mm. Uh, now, if you go to the IO Utils unit, uh, you'll see in there where we test for platforms that we're running on uh, because files get put in different directories. But if you use as a programmer the TPath and the, the documents, you know, uh, objects and the methods of them, you don't have to care where the file gets deployed, right? It's on dot asset dot slash assets dot internal on Android, on iOS, it's startup. 
with a capital S, capital U slash uh, documents, capital D. On OS 10, they don't, you, you don't have to have case sensitivity, so you can do whatever, but put it there. Uh, in Windows, it's my documents. If you want to use those standard objects, me, I use a lot of IO utils, just because when I have to deal with local file systems, forward slash backslash, volume letters, you just, everything gets taken care of for you when you need to do real file system work. That's one of my favorite units as well. Uh, I've, I've often thought about trying to re implement X tree such that it works on Android and OS yep. and Windows and yeah. OS 10, that'd be quite cool. Yeah, the other feature now with, 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 with Get It Package Manager is that we can put more things in Get It Package Manager. That started in XE8, you just go under Tools, Get It Package Manager, and you see there, oh, I need those components, or I, I want the, the turbo power lockbox, you know. I don't have to go find it somewhere else. You just click on install, and it installs it. It's a, you're in, you don't have to shut down the AV, you're just there using yeah, it. Yeah, it, it, it updates the um, uh, paths. And yeah, and the, the search path, the yeah. known packages file, all this stuff just happens. The components just show up. It's very cool. I think Microsoft and has NuGet and there's yeah, other you, systems and you like this. The, the paths get removed, yeah. and it's, it's quite And then, quite you know, nice. if there's things for sale, you go to Get It Package Manager, you'd see a buy button. So you click a buy button, it'll take you to the shop site. You, you know, you buy the product, you put the license key in the ID, you come, you don't have to quit, come back in to Get It Package Manager, the buy button changed to install. Oh, you don't need that anymore? You don't want it in your install? There's the button change to uninstall. It's click, it's gone. And you can always go back and click install again if you want. Or you could build up a big uh, repository of all the add-on yeah. stuff that you want to install. It can often be quite challenging um, getting all the packages to, to play nice together. Yeah, right? but we, we help do that so, for you. Yeah. So now, lately, uh, Jedi Runtime, Jedi VCL, that stuff is there. We've got that working and get it. So, you know, people always wonder, well, where do I find the version that works with my product? And and so all these things we're doing, and others are helping us. You know, Roman Casimov, a bunch of people are helping us in the community, MVPs, tech partners, and so on, uh, so that we can deliver even more easy functionality so you don't have to, oh, uh, i got to go install, compile the packages, and update paths, and what's going on in my registry, it all just happens, and you don't, you just, Start your project. Open your project. There's the components. Everything's good. Yeah, indeed. So yeah. sometimes it's not language syntax. It's all these other cool things that make programming simpler these days. Yeah, it's language. gone from. I mean, it used to be um, in terms of learning a language. You know, you'd learn um, so much of the language and so much of the sort of runtime library. And now the language is maybe a little bit bigger, but the runtime library is just enormous. Yeah. You spend all your time learning learning how to use the, the libraries rather than the uh, actual programming in the language. So having the source code of the libraries is good, having samples that you can read. Uh, Grady Booch is uh, working with the Computer History Museum in, the, in Silicon Valley, and one of the things they're collecting is a repository of source code, of classic source code, VisiCalc, other things that in the past, so that people can go just as you would go to another museum and read you know, historic documents and writings and recordings that are our, our, uh, you know, our Library of Congress where you could hear music that was recorded in, out in the middle of nowhere 100 years ago and so on. Uh, you can go and you can look and read because we know we learn from looking at source code. We know we read programs, read samples. We read documentation. Uh, some of us also just go in the ID and type object dot and, and see, see, what what yeah. see what yeah. shows up and, and, well, I'll, I'll and, that. Yeah. and look for some things. Well, you know the objects are named mostly clearly about what you're trying to do. And probably the methods and, and fields and events are probably named pretty good as opposed to very cryptic. So you kind of go like, okay, I want this object that does something with tree view. So, okay, tree view, you know, you do that in the, op in the component palette as well as you've got all these things installed. And there's something like dot and then watch what pops up and, and start typing it again. Uh, then parenthesis, all these kind of added things that most modern development environments have to help guide you. If, if you want to see a whole big list, put in like, the, what is it, the t-tasks uh, dot uh, run or to run a task or, you know, uh, and see, or four, four is probably smaller. I think task run, you know, you end up with a whole list of all the overloaded. Uh, yeah, first parameters. Yeah. Uh, and that's pretty cool, though, to show you, 
if nothing else, you see the depth of the flexibility you have versus having to call lots of different methods to do different things. It's, we have you know default parameters. Some people love them, some people don't, okay. But it, again, if you're not sure, hit parenthesis, you'll see if there's default parameters that you don't have to care about. Some people, it's scary. I usually put the parameter there. There's times when I'm doing a lot of C++ code, sorry, Delphi community, uh, where I hit, I put parentheses around, you know, void functions or procedures. I, just, I don't know why, it's more muscle memory, right? You don't have yeah. to do it, of course, but I sometimes just go like, okay, I'm gonna put parentheses there, you know, just because I'm in that mode. And I yeah. put semicolons, I used to be religious about not putting semicolons where I knew I didn't need to put them because because of the terminators of end and other things. But you know, because when you're in C++ sometimes, you, I'm sorry if I put a semicolon right before an end. I, uh, I prefer having the semicolons. But now with all, the Castel, with all the Castelia stuff truly integrated in 10 Seattle, instead of being its own little menu and kind of plug-in thing, a lot of those kind of helping things while you're programming and typing uh, they're just happening for you, the matchings and, and, and indentation guides and all sorts of things. But I also know there's more stuff to do, and so I always tell people, keep suggesting more. I watch Open Voice, I watch Stack Overflow, people send emails, they come to our events, and they ask for things, and, and we talk about them. We talk about, okay, I always think we can do this sugar in the syntax. We can add every language compiler capability that any language ever has, and I, I hope we do, I'm a language junkie. Should we add some more functional stuff, some more declarative stuff? Um, but at the same time, we also think about what are you trying to solve? What's the problem you're trying to solve? Uh, what are you trying to make simpler? Um, so anonymous methods, that was really cool. People just got tired of having to create a function that was doing a small amount of stuff that you just wanted to see right when you were programming, where like an inline, inlining wouldn't necessarily help in some ways. So, not that you should just put on methods all yeah. over the place, just for you the, write, just because you can. You can, and you can write really terrible code, but the yeah. methods are really unreadable. Yeah, um, but again, if you're just doing a small amount of work and you want it right there, and you don't need a name, and, and you know, try to make up a name. You know, create, you know, um, to thread dot, yeah. uh, create an honest thread or something. That, yeah. If that's just, you can, Start a new thread and call synchronize in it, and get yep. uh, you know, your interface. And the other and, thing, uh, yeah, it's the other thing I should say is is there's some really good authors that are in our Delphi community that are writing great books. We've had more new books about Delphi and VCL and FireMonkey programming. I mean, Marco Cantu's Object Pascal Handbook, uh, Nick Hodges. Coding in Delphi and more coding in Delphi. I've, I've read the coding in Delphi. I haven't got around to reading more coding in Delphi. You know, uh, Delphi. It's code. <laughs> it's all about code. He does have a chapter on components in more Dick Cook. Okay. You know, more coding in Delphi. He does have a component chapter, but that's good. I think not everybody writes components. Most people use components. Like we all leverage components. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. But and and I don't get any money from Nick for saying this, and I did write the foreword for more coding in Delphi, I had the honor of Nick asking me to do that. I met Nick in 1992, I think, at the Naval Postgraduate School Computer Club. I drove down, he was a student there, uh, and then he joined us for a while, and he's off doing cool things, but uh, Daniel Letiti's got a Fire Monkey Recipes book, and there's other great books that are out there. It's it's great to see those e-books and, and real like paper books coming out again. Indeed, the whole, self-publishing movement has, yeah. has made um, yeah print on demand it's, yeah it's all, all economic again to, to yep. do, you don't you don't need to do a run of 10,000 books you, you don't know. have this big publisher yeah. that's doing whatever with your materials and marketing or not yeah and so but yeah if you care about Delphi programming coding in Delphi more coding in Delphi by Nick Hodges we've had special offers if you bought certain versions of our products where you get the ebook for download but yep. you know there's nothing like having that Paper book when you're away yep. from the computer. Yeah, I managed to get my signed copy uh, when I, I met Nick in um, Australia for the yeah. ADAG, ADAG Symposium yeah. 2013. So yeah, so it's 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 really a renaissance. I need to get a copy of the signed copy. Of this. <laughs> in a sense, it's a renaissance again. The amount of things we can do and how we're extending the reach. I think FireDAC. You know, when we brought on Dimitri and the technology from NADAC, from DA Soft and the NADAC things, and how we've evolved FireDAC 
as the as the go forward database access strategy, and then you know FD schema adapter and and oh FD mem table. I mean, we could have a discussion about, or Kerry Jensen would have that discussion with you about client data cert versus FD mem table. But there's so much you can do: local SQL processing, all these things. Yeah, that, I've I've not got around to learning um, FIDEC yet. It's on yeah. it's on my to do list. And it works for your VCL apps. So that's great. Or your FireMonkey apps. It's there. I think in 10 Seattle now. This is not a little plug. We added MongoDB support. Years ago, I was writing about this emerging of NoSQL databases, uh, these uh, name value pairs, tuples, all these kinds of things that were coming out for document-based or other kinds of online collection of data like Facebook uses, I think Cassandra, or they've moved, I'm not sure. But um, you know, it's not just a SQL-only world, just as before, when it before SQL Paradox and DBase and other file systems or database table type systems that are out there, even our old B tree uh, in the database toolkit for Turbo Pascal <laughs> many years ago. Um, but FireDoc is really cool, what you can do and how it optimizes for all these databases. Or you don't even have to talk to a SQL database, use an FD mem table in memory. XML, JSON, binary format. What well, could be better? Uh, REST client library. Being able to, mm. to easily get to REST services. You know, we used to have to do the SOAP and all these other things, but now I can't think of a major company that has an online cloud and or service that doesn't also support a REST interface. Indeed. Um, it's so so common now to have an a, some sort of API, usually via OAuth or... Yep. Um, get some like JSON, it. attach it, use the REST data set adapter component and make that JSON turn it into a data set so you can use it like you would want to use with fields and, and values. And then all your data away controls, just, yeah. I mean, I, again, I, I'm the kid in the candy store as an older programmer with all these innovations that have happened that are, that are built on top of a component model that has been around since 1995. The same property method event. Yes, attributes and other things that we've added. RTTI or enhanced RTTI for doing adding dynamic capabilities to your applications, querying more than just, hey, there's a function out there, let me call it. Um, all of those kind of innovations over all these years and more innovations to come as well. I have some of my favorite ones that I hope show up. I, I'd like to do an inline declaration of a variable. I, you know, I don't want to have to go back up in the far section somewhere. I, I think we could do. I think we no, could do that in the possibly. Uh, you know, uh, those Pascal pur purists would probably uh, dispute that. But. Yeah, but we, we've um, done some other things. I mean, there's these for loops. You know, we've done some yeah. things to allow you to do more. I mean, certainly, you, you know, if you know you're refactoring, you know, control shift V on a yep. undeclared variable. Yeah, you, create you've, got, for you. you've got an array, you don't have to sit there, you know, dynamic arrays, there's just been things that have been added to make it easier where we help you under the covers do things, so you can just iterate through an array regardless of its size. Yeah, you got to create it and set it up correctly, but after that you don't have to go, what were those constants, I got to have a low max, upper, you know, things that you used to have to do that, that now we have these capabilities like dynamic arrays. And you so quickly take um, take them for granted, and then you have to go do something back in an older version, version of Delphi, and then you type something out, and it doesn't work. No, it's, and I understand. It's, I understand. It's, we don't backport. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's fine. Features, I mean, yeah. I wouldn't expect you to uh, um, add add generics to Delphi Seven or <laughs> something like yeah. that. Well, in your code, you can if def the code based on compiler version. Yeah, um, yeah. So, um, how do you stay current with all the all the, the new new stuff that comes along? What's your strategy for uh, I for read everything. I try everything. I download other language compilers. I download other environments. I, I don't go to as many developer conferences, but you know, I watch the live keynotes and sessions from Apple and Google I.O. and Microsoft Build and, and other conferences, or if they have recordings, I go and watch them. But I read a lot, and I program. I don't program big application systems. But I program, I try to program every day, whether I'm working on updating one of my little utilities or my email blasters or my data analysis programs of the registration database trends over time or whatever. But I'm also writing samples to, to learn or to give to customers to show them, here's how you take a Philips Hue light and turn it green or red <laughs> or purple. Uh, so 
if I figure, if I program every day and I try languages and I read everything I can get my hands on, I also have a luxury of, I'm with a whole bunch of people, great engineers in Embarcadero, who show us all things, not just me. They show us what they're doing with the runtime library. They show us what they're doing with the language. They show us what they're doing with VCL. Uh, we have all these great members of our community. Yourself, Alistair Christie, you. Ray Kanopka, Nick Hodges, Kerry Jensen, the list could go on and on, and I, I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to signal out this one or that one. I work, Jim McKeith works with me, he's out there, we're just, you know, we're fanatics as it relates to technology and how programmers can do things with, with APIs and platforms and types of applications and software architectures. So ultimately, I just read and try a lot, but I also have the luxury of people showing me things. So. I, I can uh, take advantage of that uh, as much as possible as well. But program every day, read everything, you know. Okay. Yeah. Well, what sort of the um, uh, sort of weirdest places you've seen Delphi being used? Oh, let's see. There's weirdest places. There's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a, a guy at um, uh, the develop conference is using uh, Delphi applications to, with um, cotton gins. Kind yeah, of no, there's been, there been every kind of it. I mean, in the early days, there was cattle management systems and, and uh, um, uh, boy, a 3D face recognition and uh, lightweight 3D scanning. They, these guys in Belgium scanned my face using a green laser and a camera with a Delphi app. Uh, in museums, the interactive systems where the, the character in the museum is talking to you and you're talking back, reliving history and it's voice recognition. Um, there's other stuff that's just too wacky and crazy to say. We met a guy, he does, he does uh, cattle management uh, software in Delphi. They, uh, they started with just manual processing where they click, you know, they clip a tag with letters and numbers on the ear yep. of the cow. And then they they've gone. They went to uh, NFC tags, and now they're going to move. They're exploring moving to beacons. So he's gone through the sort of manual to starting um, to automate. To some of them have got a couple of cows, um, and they've got RFID tags. Um, yep. A lot of uh, try reading them actually should, should do that. Yeah. Um, but it would be I'd, I have this this thought of um, uh, getting a whole bunch of cheap phones that have that support Bluetooth LE, and getting a solar panel and um, having them at various places around the farm and putting. Uh, um, beacons on yep. the cows, and then I'd be to track where the cows are going. Yep. And I had the thought if I put one on the head and one on the tail, I'd be to track the direction as well. Uh, but <laughs> there was a developer recently we blogged about this that uh, there was the Rosetta uh, satellite project that went out to intercept the comet, and the Phil A lander. There's no Delphi software on those satellites and landers. But a lot of the automated test software, because they needed to test all this hardware and software that was going up, a bunch of that was done in, in Delphi. Um, you know, there's Delphi in, uh, being used in back end systems of, of Disneyland parks. And, you know, you just, there's just, the, Delphi's, you don't realize Delphi means, the classic one is Windows version of Skype, you know, the user interface side of that, not the communication VoIP side. That's all Delphi. There's lots of this Delphi that's just there because people can build things quickly and it's native compiled code so it performs very well. Um, but I don't know, we have a lot of stories on the case study thing. There's some really wacky things I, I'd rather not, I'd mention privately for example, <laughs> but I don't know, in a recording, in a mixed audience, yeah, uh, you know, of different ages maybe I might you have to think about. Yeah, no, Delphi is used in all sorts of uh, all sorts of industries, and I think because it's it's um, it's so easy to pick up and, and use and actually achieve things with it. Um, I think you know a lot, a lot of hobbyist programmers and amateurs and stuff have, have managed to write quite sophisticated programs to yeah. in their um, uh, in their whatever their field happens to be. Embedded real time medical healthcare robotics, you know, the list just, you know, there's also just a lot of client server, you know, what I call meat and potatoes business programming, data input, data processing, and then form report, you know, reporting coming out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've worked in real estate um, banking and legal industries now, um, and yeah, it's, 
and yeah, Delphi is, 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 can be used just about anywhere. Yeah, I, I was, there was one company, they were doing, um, it's like data input, but there's a lot of old, older companies that have paper documents, paper receipts, paper invoices, and they want them all computerized. So what the company does is they scan the document form and they build a Delphi form for it. Okay. Right? And then, and they have, I don't know, there's like 30 programmers they have, I don't know, I forget how many thousand, tens of thousands of forms, each one in a separate, you know, like unit. And then when a certain, some forms are sort of standard, you know, I don't know, Avery or whatever, there's certain kinds of forms. Uh, there's other that are so custom they were printed for a company. They scan all the documents digitally and then it goes to this company with this room full of people keyboarding. And in fact, they're even out in the cloud in the internet. And uh, what you see on the screen, and this is a very simple Delphi, is you put a T image on that screen of the, of the, of the paper form yeah. that's been cleaned up through digital image processing. And you have the, the Delphi version of that form. And they're just doing data entry. And multiple people are doing data entry. And the software just verifies if there's typos because something doesn't disagree. And there's somebody who just goes, that's the one, that's the one, that's the one. And they're just processing through massive numbers. Now you'd think, well, they should just use OCR and it would read everything and put all the digits in the right place. Some of these like carbon copy forms, you know, that are in the back, you know, that have been pressed and they're, no matter how you clean them up, the human eye can do much yeah. more to try to figure out, was that a one or a six or an A again, as it's some old faded yeah, form. Yeah, as, as amazing as computers are, they're still no match for the human brain in, in yeah. many areas. I mean, a, lot of, a lot of the area, you know, sort of trivial things like, um, you know, that's a cat, that's a dog kind of stuff, which we just, you know, yeah. don't even think about, uh, requires huge quantities of computational power. To yeah. I go to my dentist to now. Used to be they'd shot x-rays of your mouth, and then the, you know, they'd wait for the film to develop, and they'd show it to you, and you had to put this big thing the on. Thing, yeah. Now it's all digital. Digital x-ray, they put this little probe in your mouth. It shows up immediately, you know, there it is on the screen, and they can, since it's bitmaps and they didn't have to go digitize, there's no film anymore. They show you, they do a, a bitmap compare, it's a Delphi app that looks at the bitmap so it can see, overlay the yeah. mouth and the teeth and look for, and it highlights the differences changes, in, yeah. in darkness and other things that are going on. Um, the, you know, the analysis of how things have changed, you know, so just as we would do a source code diff, they're doing a bitmap diff and a data diff of your mouth, yeah, right? Cool. And it's all in real time and you're watching it. Uh, I'm sitting there going like, because I think it's cool, I just sit there and, and look, and I can tell it's a Delphi app. I won't say the name of the company because I'm not supposed to, but you can tell it's a Delphi app when you look at a screen and the buttons look a certain way and the, you know, the tree views look a certain way yeah. and the panels look a certain way and you go like, because mm. even though it's Windows, you know, Windows handle under the covers, there's just Delphi, and if they use some styling, then you know as well. I used to always like to do that when I go to companies that, or like a, there's a gym nearby, and you know, they're, do, they're locking you in, and you look at the screen, and you go like, oh, that's that's a Delphi app, you know, it's probably got the BDE and a Paradox table. Yeah, probably, it, yeah. Probably <laughs> underneath, and it's been running, you know, forever, and it probably will run forever as well. Yeah, there's, there's so, so many legacy applications that just, just run. Yeah. Well, until Microsoft drops 32-bit Windows API support. Yeah. Maybe. Which they're not going to do anytime soon, I don't think. I don't know. They dropped 16, I suppose. They did drop so, 16 eventually. So Windows 7 was the last? Or was it Windows Vista the last one? Uh, maybe Vista. Vista. I'm not sure about that. I mean, 16-bit Windows. Otherwise, you could you know could do some fun things. I still so have you a... you now have to upgrade your Dell to one applications. Yeah. If you want to run on Windows well, 7. Well, no, or you could run a... I have a Windows 3.1.1 VM. And okay, I have Delphi, yeah, that's and I have true. Delphi yeah. 1 running. <laughs> I have Delphi 1. We showed that during Delphi week in February. I have uh, Delphi 1 running on Windows 3.1.1, uh, Windows for work groups. So, but... Oh, but, I'm sure that actually screams on one hardware in terms of oh, yeah. really no, if, you run, if you compile a program, I mean, we've done this big long programs and how fast they compile. Uh, I think the other thing was the, what was it, the delay? There was a runtime library function. I think it's still a delay and it, it was so fast you couldn't big enough precision and it would, you know, to get the real delay on a modern, you know, 
Core i7 Intel thing, it runs so fast that you can So that's why we tell people, okay, you can remove that procedure call and call sleep or you know, go out to the operating system, uh, run the timer event or whatever, T timer. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Indeed. Okay, well, I probably need to get to the airport shortly. Um, is there anything else you sort of like to add? Well, just that we're moving forward. I think some people, I think most of our Delphi customers. By now, all around the world have received a letter from mm -hmm. Randy Jacobs, who is the CEO of IDERA. Um, there was news a few weeks ago about the potential acquisition of a marketer by IDERA, and that deal completed about a week and a half ago, and we've been talking to our partners and customers about that, but now we've put out a global email from Randy Jacobs. He even included his email address. He talked about the go forward strategy, you know, go forward of the Embarcadero database tools and the developer tools. Uh, for the developer tools, I'm wearing my Embarcadero polo shirt. Uh, we're going to keep the Embarcadero brand name, Embarcadero Red Studio, Embarcadero Delphi, Embarcadero C++ Builder, um, and so we're going to be running that business and brand. So from the standpoint of the roadmap and all the work that we're doing and our go forward strategy, we're moving forward. And the great news is. Embarcado and Nigeria come together. It's a bigger company with more resources, with shared interests and shared best practices, yep. uh, which means that we can do even more and have a bigger company helping all the products, database tools and developer tools. But we're going to keep moving forward. Uh, you know, some people have wondered, gee, are we going to still do VCL when we're doing FireMonkey? Well, we got all the new stuff in 10 Seattle, new components and integration to Windows 10. We acquired the uh, the Ray's software VCL components, we now call it the Kanopka Signature VCL controls. That's a big investment in bringing not only all of those controls available for purchase, but we're going to be using some of the cool technologies Ray pioneered of additional kind of property editors and sort of these you know, pages where you can set a whole bunch of options instead of having to go down under every object inspector thing, turning and setting things and so on. We're going to be merging all of this, a lot of those best practices into the VCL as a whole for people. So you've seen, you've seen us growing both by internal development, but by bringing on additional products and technologies uh, where we've purchased the intellectual property and, and so on. And that just is another reminder of the commitment and if you, as you read Randy Jacobs' letter, you'll see that there's, you know, we're planning to do even more to grow not only the business, but to give you uh, additional capabilities that you can take advantage of, uh, more resources to add more stability to all of the work, the quality that we're doing. I mean, 10 Seattle, large memory model ID. So with big, big projects, you can load them all up and go for it. Um, and I've, I've noticed going from uh, Delphi 2007 to XE8, um, the memory usage is quite a lot yep. more substantial. Um, well, so we kept adding things to the IDE and other things that were happening yeah, background to, give, to, to yeah. give people more more capability, but that comes so, at, at, a, at a price of memory. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to going, going to Seattle. Yeah. Um, to see so it resolves this. So you probably got that letter. We're moving forward. We've got our Embarcadero name, Delphi C++ Builder, FireMonkey VCL, moving forward, the roadmap. Uh, to Linux and other things we're doing and we'll be updating the roadmap as we move along as always and so everything is is cool and uh, and we can keep programming Delphi it's really neat okay all right thank you very much for your time thanks uh, Alistair it's good to see you indeed